So uh, my, my major conflict is that I'm the president of the Rothman Institute. I'm a, an academy uh, board member. And, and Jens asked me to talk about the Rothman Institute model. And uh, first of all, I'm humbled by Ed and Connor's talks. You know, thank you. I, I, I learn every day. I, I just thank God I don't do trauma surgery anymore. I just do spinal trauma. So as of Saturday, a newspaper article published in the New York Times noted that 56 of all orthopedic practices are either owned by a hospital or by private equity, which I think is disheartening. Uh, you know, I, I hate to see orthopedic surgeons lose their autonomy. And, and what we have at the Rothman Institute is an opportunity to stay as an independent single specialty group. And I'll talk about the pros and cons of that. So we started in the 70s. Dick Rothman passed away two years ago. Right now we actually have 212 uh, physicians. And we have sort of a hub and hub model where we're based in Southeast Pennsylvania, but we have relationships in New York, Bergen County, Southeast uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, Western Pennsylvania. And we're discussing a relationship in Seattle at the present time. And, and we have a typical mission of an orthopedic group. We want to give the best MSK care possible. We're committed to sort of a platform to sort of maintain independence with the traditional values that an orthopedic group would have. So, you know, this slide is a little bit outdated. We have 212 surgeons at the present time. We take care of all of the major uh, professional teams in Southeast Pennsylvania, uh, and we're involved in 50 bundle payment uh, groups at the present time. We cover all the different varieties of orthopedic care. This slide is important if you look at the bottom in brown, is that this is part of our business acumen. We, we focus on, you just can't be an entity, you can't be an orthopedic surgeon alone. You need to be supported by non-operative sports medicine, physiatrists, pain management physicians, and so forth. And they sort of, we all work together as a team. Uh, so um, it's a funnel where an orthopedic surgeon treats the right patient at the right time. You are a surgeon. So we look at things called conversion rates. When you go to clinic, um, you're not a hero if you see 50 patients. If, if you sign up six patients, why don't you only see six patients that day for surgery? Um, they can be cared for better by non-operative care. So we've sort of have a non-operative operative method. Um, in the last year, we average about 260 to 300 peer review articles a year. We have the number one publication rate in the country. And in, in terms of the United States, we're the number one, number eight funded in research by the NIH. And uh, we really, uh, I, I think Rothman started the, the academic prowess by focusing on total joint arthroplasty. And if you look here, um, they come out with H index and so forth, the publications, but the Rothman Institute, and, and we pay our physicians, not based on how many surgeries they do, we pay our physicians on their academic mission. And we base that on both clinical quality care, uh, how often they contribute to the peer review uh, literature and so forth. And that's how you get paid. And I always say, if, if you work at the Rothman Institute and you lecture at the academy, you lecture at your specialty societies and you publish peer review articles, you will be paid more than someone who just does surgery. So that's our focus. And this is sort of an overview uh, in 2021. Those are our offices. Um, this office is down in Florida uh, and now in Western Pennsylvania. So as of 2019, we did about 88,000 uh, procedures uh, and see about 900,000 patients a year. And you could see in 1998, there were six of us and we sort of had that sort of philosophy of staying independent, working with healthcare philosophies and the revenue from 98 to 2019 has increased. Now it's, it's closer to a billion dollars in revenue, just focusing on maintaining what we do best and that's caring for orthopedic uh, processes. So the way we engage, um, we're, we, we, our brand is academic. And I think that's the most important thing. You can have a good clinical machine and take care of patients, but if you don't study what you do as, as both Ed and Connor presented, if you don't constantly study, constantly report, keep registries and focus, um, you're really not contributing to the treatment of orthopedic problems. So we, we focus on clinical performance, academic engagement, and then everyone has to work hard up until you retire, you're taking call, you're covering the emergency room, you're coming in at night. And, and this is sort of is based on the pressures that we see in the markets today. I mean, it is incredible what we need to do. Every year, CMS comes out with new regulations. We're getting pressure on reimbursement. There's more regulations uh, and, and quality of life. I mean, we wanna go home, we wanna see our family. And as we said, I remember my, uh, when Rothman met with me in 1993, when I became an attending, he said out of the 18 surgeons that he worked with, 17 are divorced many multiple times. And that's just not acceptable in today's uh, 
uh, paradigm of, of lifestyle. So we need to have some sort of independence. And, and if people look at what makes people happy, I always say there's three things that make people happy, autonomy, doing what you love and mastering what you love well. So that's the focus. So the different types of models that we have out there, you have the private practice model, which we support. You have the employment model, which is acceptable to a lot of people. And then you have the, the, the hybrid model where you have part academics, part private practice. One of the biggest problems we had when we had a relationship with the university is the university puts you in an RVU, they recalculate every three years, your services are not as, as valuable to them, where maybe they want to focus on transplant surgery, maybe they want to focus on cardiac surgery, maybe you're not paying attention to your case mix and they sit down with you and they say, listen, you've done a million cases this year, but you know, most of them were uninsured. So we, you know, yeah, you understand, we just can't pay as much and you have no autonomy and you're not, you have no ownership. And then you have problems with the people that work with you. We like to sort of control uh, our teams. I mean, we look at clinical into into integrated networks and building a team around you. And if you have control over that team, you can be much more uh, productive. And, and the bottom line, if you look at the average revenues, the Academy published last week, the average orthopedic surgeon brings in about 2.6 million in revenues and the average orthopedic salary is 516,000. Well, where did the other 1.5, $2, 2 million dollars go? It went to the hospital, it went to the university because they're more concerned about the technical fees than they are about surgeon reimbursement. So we have to keep that in mind. And if you have ownership and if you run a good business, you could see in the future, you're not gonna make a living by breaking bricks. You're gonna make a living by owning your business and, and, and pre presenting patient-facing care that's economical. So you can not only take care of everybody, but you can, you can do so in an economic fashion uh, that decreases, decreases patient morbidity. So the number one thing I think with a private model, and, and most people on this webinar know that, is physician autonomy. You make your decisions. If you're a good business person, if you give good patient care, if you take care of society as a whole, and if you focus on the social determinants of health, and we invest in our communities, you will do well and your corporation will do well. When you invent something, when you develop something, it is yours. It doesn't belong to the university. And you, sh you sit as a shareholder, and it's up to you to make sure that works well. So if you look at all the different models, and I've, I've studied all the different models, the federated models is a big movement for those that want to be, be independent. We have a whole series of doctors that are going to scale on malpractice insurance, on billing, collections, and all the back office models, but they can't expand. They have to stay in their geographic space. They can't advertise. They can't grow the way they want to do. So federation model, and again, I don't want to go into the details of the slide, but it's not as good as an integrated model. Now, private equity is coming in, and I always laugh at the concept of private equity. They're making money off of you, and there's hardly any money left in medicine. 18.7% of GDP is spent on healthcare, which is crazy. If you look at other developed countries, Germany, Switzerland, the countries that do it well, it's 10 to 12%, 5 to 7%. So now you're going to have private equity walk in and take 25% off the top and then control the business aspect. It's against the law for for private equity to run the practice of medicine, but why would you want them to run your business? You could have an insurance company come in, but at the end of the day, the insurance companies are concerned about one thing, profits. And those that go into private equity wanna have multiple bites of the apple if using a scrape model. So that doesn't work either. Or you can align with a healthcare company like HCA or so forth. But again, that's not a liquidity event. And again, you're sort of controlled by the man. So again, something to think about when you're a young orthopedic surgeon, about to go out. So at the Rothman Institute, we focus on one thing, our brand, and that's teaching, research, education, and publication. So we compensate for academics and we have a hub and hub spoke. As we branch off into different regions, all profits stay locally. And, it, and we, we, we advocate working with the healthcare system because the healthcare system is what we call, it's the capitalization it allows us to sort of do what we need to do to make sure that we can take care of the regional healthcare needs. And we're committed to resident and, and, and education. Now, this is just the Rothman model. We have four partnership criteria. You see a clinical and you see an academic. Clinical for those people that say, listen, you know, I, I loved my residency, I loved my fellowship. I'm really not into teaching. I'm not into education. You could see how they get paid a lot less than those that say, listen, I wanna be a professor. I wanna get in an airplane. I wanna travel. I wanna commit myself to boards. They actually get much more money. And the numbers that you see, just ignore the numbers, but that's, it depends on your insurance mix and so forth. But there's a certain amount of financial productivity that's necessary. You have to be an associate professor to be a, par a partner. You get paid more if you're a professor and so forth. 
and this is sort of the overview. This is how patients, uh, physicians at the Rothman Institute get paid. Academics are the most important things. You need a total of 204 points. And if you look at the schedule, the, the vast majority of those points are from academic productivity, which is the brand. And if you look at other people that do that, the Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, you'll see MD Anderson at Cooper, MD Anderson at the Mayo and MD Anderson. And they sort of follow the same protocols. They study what they do, they have clinical trials and they contribute to the, the literature. Now, once we sit down in a particular region, we have a tripartite mission. We wanna have a relationship with the healthcare system. We wanna focus on patient population. I'm not talking about bundle payments. I'm not talking about fee-for-service. Fee for I'm talking about looking at the total MSK spend in a region, which can be 20 to 30% of spend on healthcare and saying, how can we do that cheaper? How can we avoid redundant care, wasted care, fraudulent care, excessive, excessive, excessive cost care? And then how can we make things better for the actual providers so they can go home earlier and be with their family? So in terms of with the health, our healthcare partners with a particular physician, we focus on passive income, we focus on growth. If you wanna be dedicated to academics, we support that. If you wanna be an administrator, we support that. If you wanna be just a clinician, we support that. And we, we basically focus through clinical al algorithms, value-based care, using the up-to-date technologies and our business philosophy. When it comes to healthcare partners, when we sit down and we're talking to Swedish now, we, we focus on one thing, centers of excellence, getting rid of wasted care, service line management, and then getting people out of the hospital. I mean, I talk to people in all the different cities and they say, listen, our turnover time is an hour, hour and a half. You shouldn't have more than a 15 minute turnover time in a university setting. If it's more than 15 to 20 minutes, then you're not running that operating room. And that's, and that's what we have to move. Basically everything besides tertiary and quaternary care out of a hospital into an ambulatory center, which is so much cheaper. So these are just the our larger cases, these are total joint orthoplasties and spine surgeons. And you can see in 2019, the vast majority of those cases are done in healthcare systems because we partner with healthcare systems because they're dedicated to the community. These are the safety net communities that take care of the poor, that take care of the uninsured. And we are partners with them to make sure those patients get the appropriate care. So number one, it starts with taking care of your staff, getting the right local leadership. And this slide sort of is, what we do at every setting. We have a local leadership structure. All the offices are designed the same. The same. We have CINs, clinical integrated networks that are focused around the physician. Every physician has a clinical assistant, an MA, a nurse practitioner, or a PA focused on making that physician productive. So if you're a surgeon, you're seeing surgical cases. If you're a non-operative physician, you're seeing non-operative physicians. I'm a spine surgeon. And the last thing I wanna see is non-operative spine. And that's all supported by technology. And I am the biggest fan now of telemedicine. 50% of my practice is telemedicine from all across the country. And I'm gonna advocate with the legislature to make sure that remains the same. Seeing people in the office post-operatively who don't have to travel for two hours is the way to go in the future. It's crazy. In terms of patient access, bring care locally. Set up urgent care models with your clinical pathways. They can see your patients. If they have a problem, do not go to the emergency room go to an urgent care center that's hooked up with our algorithms and use telemedicine. I operate in three different hospitals. I do, I do telemedicine rounds. If I operate Monday at one hospital, Tuesday at another hospital one hour away, I'm using telemedicine to round the next day. I have a, one of my clinical nurse practitioners walk around with an iPad and I can visually see the patient. I could do it around. So every day you're talking to a patient and we do rounds at the same time. So we invite all the family members to get together. So today we're gonna to round at 9 a.m. All the family members can come, they can ask questions. So exploiting technology and give patients the opportunity. If you wanna develop a productive clinical practice, every patient has to be seen within 24 hours. You have to have concierge services, VIP programs. You have to have urgent care set up. If you are a busy spine surgeon and your next visit in three weeks, you're losing the game. You have to be able to see these patients and you can see them between cases through telemedicine if you're traveling to give a lecture at the academy, you can see them in the morning before you go to lectures and so forth. So there's a way of being productive and finishing early, which is key. Everything's based on clinical pathways. So you, you keep large registries, you study what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, you incorporate that into your uh, electronic medical records and the surgeons are paid to follow algorithms. Now, this is the practice of medicine. So you could do whatever you want, whatever you think is the best, but you wanna be within certain guidelines 
because certain care products don't make sense. We don't inject stem cells in people's knees. We don't inject stem cells in people's shoulders because we don't see the data to support that. So that would be what I would call wasted care because there's not money to support that type of practice. And these clinical pathways allow us to decrease the cost of care, decrease length of stay, decrease surgical site infections. Rarely does any patient ever go to a SNF or a rehab center. Everyone is focused to go home the next day. You do a scoliosis operation, we're focused to go home the next day. And if you can't go home the next day, if this have to spend the next day, that's okay. But stay out of a rehab center because it doesn't make any sense. So these are the different uh, protocols we use. We study everything. So optimal clinical pathways, PAT block times, preoperative algorithms that we focus on. In the operating room, we've done studies that if you start a case at 6.15 and, and do the same case at 8 o'clock in the morning, you will finish that case 23% quicker. Turnover times, as I said before, 14 to 20 minutes. And if the hospital says it can't happen, then you go to a different hospital. So you have to do it. And we use staggered rooms. We're involved in the key elements of every procedure. But to have a surgeon be in one room and spend an hour and a half sitting around is waste. It, a surgeon's not working to the level of their license. So everything we do is focused on being more efficient. And then the post-operative strategies, the in-hospital strategies, everyone follows. And, and you have to get everyone to buy in on it. And spinal cord injury, do you give steroids? Do you use braces? Do you, everyone does the same DVT uh, prophylaxis. Everything is sort of standardized. If you have 20, we have 19 spine surgeons. If all 19 spine surgeons did whatever they want to do, then we just, we're no different than anyone else because now it's going to take time. People are going to make mistakes. So we want to focus on that. And then on discharge, you want to focus on sending them home, getting someone to care for them at home. They do so much better. You decrease readmissions, you decrease ER visits, you decrease infection rates, you decrease DBTs. Sending them to an to a uh, extra care facility is not the way to go in orthopedics. And this is all based on analytics. And one of the first things that we've done is that we, we just basically use artificial intelligence to cull disaggregated data to find out who's doing well, who's not doing well. We use remote monitoring. If we see a yellow or red on someone's iPhone that did not walk in the way they should have a total joint osteoplasty, bring them in, make a phone call. If we see a green, we know they're doing well and we don't have to do that. And all this remote monitoring and technology develops weekly report cards. So we can see exactly what complications we're having, what patients are readmitted. And for each surgeon, and this is an example, each vertical bar is an individual case a particular surgeon has done. So this surgeon can see at the end of the month where every one of his patients went, did they get home, what did it cost that patient in the operating to do that procedure? What are the cost outliers and, and so forth? And when you see this every week, what happens when you study something, you get better at it. So this particular surgeon with this particular cost, two months later has a graph that looks like this because now he's studying it every day with big data. And he's like, listen, the other spine surgeon over there is spending 5,000 in an operating room doing a single level T lift. And this, this surgeon is doing it for 2000. Well, why can't you do it for $2,000? It doesn't make any sense. So getting away from that, we went through a 12 year journey through episodes of care. And that's sort of, and I, I advocate this for everybody. You may be in, in, in episodes of care. You may not be in episodes of care. I'll tell you what episodes of care allows you to do. It allows you to see how much money you're spending. And if you do, if you do time driven cost accounting, will you tag every person that touches the patient? So the front desk person, the valet person, the nurse that preps the patient, and you look at their salary and how much time they spend with the patient. And at the end of the day, you know your exact cost. I'm not talking about claim costs. I'm talking about your exact cost. And then you can go to the insurance companies and say, in, in order for me to make a 6% margin, I need to get paid this. And you get better at it and you get better at it. The problem with bundle cares, it's a race to the bottom. So it's not the future, but it's a step to population health. And the way we do that is we use artificial intelligence. We have these automated questionnaires that patients answer and they go through a series of questions. We have 43 medical questions and 15 social questions. And depending on where they fall, it tells me where that patient is gonna get admitted. If the patient has complex medical problems, then they have to be optimized before they come to the hospital. So I could bring them and, and do them in a community hospital or a specialty hospital, or maybe an ASC with a care suite. So you sort of do that. And I'm not talking about the cases that Ed and Connor are taking care of. I'm talking about elective degenerative disease, tumor, and elective infection cases. So you do the patient, the right patient in the right facility. And let me tell you something, you're saving a lot of money if you do that. And if you look at, as we walk into a different community, 
and over time, 2015 to 2020, the blue graph shows all the lower cost facilities because you really don't have to do cases at a university hospital unless they're a tertiary case or a trauma case. Why wouldn't you not do a total joint arthroplasty in a ambulatory surgical center, same day discharge? It doesn't make any sense to me. If you're an ASA three or above, I can understand it, but why not put them in a care suite? The amount of money that you can save. And then you develop networks with preferred providers. You go to the pain management doctors that don't churn the patient with narcotics, that don't churn the patient with injections, that don't repeat physical therapy. You could set them up in home therapy. So you figure out who the right partners are and you make your own personalized narrow network to save costs and the patients do better. And then you use remote monitoring, which I think is the best thing where patients are told preoperatively how to prepare for surgery. They're told they're sent text messages in the hospital to say what to expect. And then the follow-up, it goes over everything. If they have any questions, it's, it's, it's sent to your uh, extended care provider that who can look at that so they can follow it. And then they can pair it to your data population of patients who've had a similar procedure so they can see how they're doing compared to someone else who had a total joint arthroplasty. And they say, well, listen, even though I don't feel too good, I'm doing exactly as expected. It saves them the phone call and it gives confidence to the patient. So in the last 12 years, we did a series of bundles and I want you to focus on the fact that it was easy to save money across the board in the bundles because of the excessive amount of money spent in healthcare. And then you develop a gain sharing program and that money goes right back into reinvesting into your organization. And it goes right back to the physicians that care for these patients. But this slide is really important. If you look at the far left corner, if you go down to far left column, go down to CMS, if you follow that over, you could see in 2018, 2019, we lost money in CMS. So what did the Rothman Institute do? We pulled out of all CMS bundle payments because it is basically designed to show you how to be efficient. But every time you become more efficient, they reset the target price. And then you have the, the management company that takes two to 3% off. So you cannot do well with a bundle payment program after a certain amount of years. And I always laugh when people say, oh, I'm doing great in bundle payments. Well, you're not doing bundle payments right because if you're doing bundle payments right, it's a race to the bottom. This is not the way to go in the future. The way to go in the future is if someone needs surgery, they go to the operating room right away. It's not, you have to do six weeks of that or seven weeks of that or three injections. If they need surgery, they need surgery. If they don't need surgery, they never come to the operating room. And if they don't need surgery, you don't churn them with non-operative care. And that's how you save money. If you look at the graph on the left, orange is bad. That means they're being done in high cost centers, i.e. universities uh, and tertiary care centers. And then once you sort of institute these programs, it turns blue, which means now they're being done, now they're being discharged home, and it's saving money for the entire healthcare system. Blue in these pictures is the Rothman Institute. And as we move into different areas, you can see 96% of patients are sent home, one to 1.5% go to an extended care facility. We decrease the cost of care by about 40%. And that puts us sort of in the top 10% of CMS, even though we don't participate anymore, we're in the top 10% of CMS. And these graphs just show you, again, we're the blue, and you could decrease readmissions, infection rates, e ED visits, and complications, and so forth, which is important. Now, this is just an example. So this is a CMS, and we're the blue line, and we're in the top 4% of the country, and we were losing money. Because locally, they said, okay, they could care less what the group next to us was doing, what the group on the left of us was doing. They just continue to compare yourself to yourself, which makes sense for the government. But once you get to the point where you can't go any lower, what you would do is you would sacrifice quality care for a patient. So it's not the way to go in the future, but it's a great exercise to do that. And then on top of that, you have to make a service organization. We go to the Ritz-Carlton and we have the Ritz-Carlton people come in and tell us, how do you make people feel good about their stay? The comfortable environment, the way you approach them in the front desk, the way you make them feel, the fact that they have immediate access to the jelly beans and our electronic medical records, and you manage your brand on social media. Now remember, social media is a, is a double-edged sword. It's weaponized, it can be manipulated, but it's the way to go in the future just to make sure you get the message out because you wanna do the, again, like I said, the quadruple aim, the right patient, the right place, the right time, and I say the right price. And when I talk about the right price, I'll get that into a second. You have to decrease the cost of care that's provided by your community. So when we go into a new community, we do four things. We assess what is going on in the community. We sit down and talk to the surgeons. How's everything going? We don't go into any community where things are going great. But if someone tells me my turnover time is an hour and a half, I get home at six o'clock at night and I'm in one room and I do two cases, well, that's a problem. 
Then we sit down and we plan. We say, listen, is there a way that we can make the quality of life for the orthopedic surgeon and the quality of care better? Then we sort of implement a plan. And then we come in, if we, we can make sort of a business arrangement, we monitor the outcome. And it's usually a nine month process and how we do that. If you look at the most recent group, we, we went into central Jersey to a very successful group. It was called the Trenton group right above Princeton. And they were doing great. 2016 was a small group revenues, revenues of, of 19 million. And you can see in three years, we almost doubled the revenue. 94% increase in net operating income. We dropped their expenses by 21% and increased their revenues by 51%. And not only that, the surgeons who were surgeons stopped seeing non-surgical cases and started to see surgical cases and it went right up. So just making care more efficient, the patients appreciated it and the non-operative physicians appreciated it. So we enhanced call center algorithms. We, we instituted marketing strategies. We allowed, we allowed every physician in their group to exercise at the level of their license. If you're a PA, you have to function at the level of the PA. If you're a nurse practitioner, you have to function at the level of the nurse practitioner. And over three years, you can see, and the brown line is the cost of care in the community. So we get in, the cost of care at this particular facility was extremely expensive. And the goal was to decrease the cost of care commensurate with, with the care in that particular market. You're not making any money in any market if you're more expensive than your competitor. So you got to make it cheaper. So I, I think from this perspective, I'm a big advocate, as you can see, with being independent, not independent as a clinician, but in, independent as an academic clinician. And every, every location is a separate autonomous market. Some, some say to me, I don't want to do any academics. And then you work around, okay, well, if you're not going to do academics, but we still have to study the outcomes and the quality and the cost, and we have to make it more efficient because at the end of the day, it's all about the patient, making their experience better and making the outcomes better. And it'll build resiliency and decrease burnout among the physicians that participate in the process. Thank you. Alex, outstanding. We're a little bit behind time, but this is well worth it. A uh, uh, couple of things. So first of all, um, a treasure trove of things. We can't address it all. And I know it's bedtime for you or past bedtime, because as we know from that great video, a day in the life of Alex Vaccaro, you get up at 3.30 a.m. and do your first morning workout. Um, so one question that came from Chad Donnelly, I'm just reading from the ample chats, is uh, if you have this 24-hour scene policy, this sounds nice, but how do you handle it when patients just cancel and don't show up? If it make it too easy to get to a doctor, how do you prevent that from getting abused? It happens all the time. You probably have a 15 to 20% call-out rate. So you handle it like an airline. If you have capacity for 10, you book 14, you end up getting nine. So, it, so you handle like an, and the, and the airline industry has done it all along the overbook. That's why occasionally, Yenz, you and I were sitting in a room, we say, we're booked tonight, we'll give you an extra $150 if you give up your ticket. You do the same thing in orthopedic care. The last thing an orthopedic surgeon wants to do is sit around and do nothing. There's only two things that don't exist in an orthopedic surgeon's mind, unicorns and the fact that they're not busy enough and making enough money. Well done. Then a second question, then we'll really come to a close as promised. Uh, underserved patients. So as is the case in Philadelphia, we have a very large population of homeless and of uh, drug abusing patients. And um, some of them have extremely long lengths of stay. So how do you handle that when you have a mission uh, in, in your hospital system? And how do you equate that with the value proposition to kind of get uh, averaged? So that's a great question. So. I'll give you an example, Thomas Jefferson University. Every university is a safety net. Every university has managed care programs for the underinsured and Medicaid. I want you to understand one thing, the hospital doesn't lose money taking care of a Medicare patient. Keep that, you lose money as an orthopedic surgeon. So don't ever get fooled by the fact that you're taking care of these patients. So what you have to do is you have to work on an arrangement with the hospital that you get your costs covered. You wanna take care of the poor, you wanna take care of the underinsured but you don't have to be the sucker like I was for years operating and getting paid nothing, but incurring the legal costs. So you work out a relationship with your local hub and hub university or hospital where you get compensated for caring for the uninsured. Alex, this is Neil Schoner. Can you hear me? Hey, Neil, how are you? Oh, I'm doing good, buddy. I just wanted to comment on you before you, because uh, you got to get to bed before that workout Thank tomorrow. God. Thank God. God loving the NFL. Uh, but uh, you, uh, there are some people on the line uh, who have a familiarity with the things you're talking about. You were talking about the parameters of population health. You were talking about eliminating toxic variation. You were talking about enhancing patient engagement. 
And you were also talking about something that we did original uh, publications and predictive analytics on the right patient, the right procedure at the right time. I wanna congratulate you. Th this was a, a wonderful presentation tonight. Uh, I thank you for being uh, open to speaking with us and uh, appreciate. And Neil, uh, you're going to get younger looking. Neil was a fellow with me in 1992, right? 1992. Yeah, yeah, you were a like junior resident. But and, you know, you're getting younger looking every day. Out, you've got a picture up from your high school years. That's cheating, man. That was ninth grade. Ninth grade. Jens, Jens asked me for my ninth grade picture. <laughs> God bless and thank you. Thanks. So we'll sign off, conclude for a great evening. Thank you all for your interest. Please, as orthopedic surgeons in Washington State, join the WSOA. And we're going to go on a summer hiatus, July and August, and restart in September. Uh, thank you much for SSF and for the WSOA board, for our speakers tonight, and the lovely Emily Jones for her everlasting care. Alex, you're awesome. And uh, we'll look forward to the 3.30 a.m. workout. Okay, man? For all the speakers, God bless. You did great work tonight. Jens, thank you.